like an odd thing to say, but Donald, his administration, his sycophants and enablers and his overlords in the Senate actually did all of us a favor. They exposed just how weak our institutions are, and they reminded us just how fragile this nascent democracy of ours really is. The problem before us is this. We need strong institutions in order to fortify democracy. The conundrum is this. We currently have 147 Republicans in the House and 10 senators who voted to overturn the results of a free and fair election. These are men and women who sought to overthrow the government and yet continue to be tasked with helping run it. Only 10 House Republicans and seven Republican senators voted to convict Donald for inciting a self-coup. To one de degree or another, the rest of them are all seditionists, yet they go undeposed, unindicted, unpunished, and perhaps even more dangerous, they're still able to run for re-election. These men and women seized on political opportunism that almost did, and if allowed to succeed next time, almost certainly will bring this country to its knees. I've heard Democrats on the January 6th committee waffle when asked if the behavior of these Republicans was illegal. They can't say. But then Congressman Jamie Raskin assures us the committee's hearing will, quote, blow the roof off the House. If we want to have a chance going forward to restore and strengthen our institutions, so future insurrectionists like Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley don't hold for one more second an office they're not fit to fill, if we want to make sure that power-hungry anti-democratic traitors like Mitch McConnell are no longer in a position to reshape the federal judiciary and turn this country into a theocratic apartheid state, the January 6th committee had better blow the roof off the fucking Senate, too. There are 197 days left until the 2022 midterms. Welcome back to the strategy sessions where every week my panel and I try to answer this question. How do we ensure that the Democrats win races at every level of government and hold on to or preferably expand its razor thin margins in the House and Senate, thereby hopefully saving the future of American democracy, at least for the time being. Uh, tonight I am thrilled to uh, welcome my panel. Uh, joining me are Dr. Allison Gill, creator of Mueller She Wrote and host of the Daily Beans podcast, Wajahad Ali, Daily Beast columnist, public speaker, and author of the phenomenal book, Go Back to Where You Came From, and other helpful recommendations on becoming American, and Bob Seska, political writer and host of the Bob Seska Show. And luckily for me, all of these incredible human beings are my friends. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary. Hello. Hello. Uh, I, hold on. I, for, sorry, I have to, I have to uh, bring my loaded gun that I, I just brought from the uh, airport, my bad, that I went through the security with. Sorry. Okay. Now we're yeah. safe. Again. I mean, <laughs> it's not surprising to me that you would show up to the airport with a loaded gun and still be able to join us tonight. Well, no, no, I, I, I'm not Madison Cawthorn. I'm not a mediocre white guy who uh, lies about orgies or doesn't lie about orgies and repeatedly, uh, you know, talks about national security, even though he breaks the law and somehow gets elected to office. If I did that as a Muslim man and a son of Pakistani immigrants, I'd be in jail. But alas, um, God bless America. Probably not just in jail, but, you know, <laughs> let's not go too dark too soon. Okay? Oh, my bad, my bad. No, no, no. Save the darkness till the later. Save the <laughs> darkness till the end after we've ex 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 uh, completely finished with the light. Yes. C can we wait, though? I'm not so sure. It's been quite a week. Quite a week. Um, there's a lot I want to talk to you about. Um, and I'm, I've am i been trying to figure out how to frame this. You know, obviously, the the general gist of, of this, this uh, episode uh, is to help people understand what's at stake hmm. in November. Um, and uh, then 
kind of help people work around the fact that the media is against us and uh, Republicans still seem to have all the power um, and help people understand how they as individuals um, can hang on to hope, you know, uh, things they can do and and maybe even ways we can help push elected Democrats to start fighting like our lives depend on it, as as you guys know, they do. Um, but I, I was not that not it not that it's surprising, but it what continues to amaze me is the increasing brazenness of these people in the other party who I'm sorry, I now consider them enemies of American democracy. Um, so Waj, well, let's start with you. Uh we're seeing people like Rand Paul openly uh, expressing in his very creepy way uh, his pro-Russia agenda. And we're seeing that the price for staying in the good graces of the Republican Party and its fucking de facto leader, Donald, uh, is to be totally cool with insurrection. Am I crazy or does that seem what that, is that what's not, going on? Look, you're not crazy at all. And it's in, in, in the fact that you even have to ask that shows you how we're so conditioned to uh, the buzzword of the day that the kids use gaslighting, where mm -hmm. those who are on the favor of democracy, those who are in the favor of truth, those who are in the favor of facts and national security. We kind of apologize to ourselves and we kind of say, like, am I the crazy one? And I'm yeah. like, no, no, you're the sane one. And just to just to piggyback off what you said to, to show how sane you are. Um, the Republican National Committee, I always try to remind people this because we're we're just overdosed with this fire hose of shit every day. The Republican National Committee, the RNC, on its own, without any coercion, decided to say that the violent insurrectionists who overtook the Capitol and tr killed five people, including a cop, and tried to kill Mike Pence, the whitest, most Christian man on earth, the vice president. So if you think you're white and Christian and Republican, you're going to be safe. I give you Mike Pence running for his life, right? Those yep. individuals, according to the RNC, are quote unquote ordinary citizens engaged in a legitimate protest. Number one. Number two, they decided when they made that statement to also censure Liz Cheney, who was the number three highest ranking Republican, a mother effing Cheney, who voted with Trump 93% of the time, and Adam Kinzinger. They decided to censure them, not Marjorie Taylor Greene, not Rand Paul, not Mo Brooks, not uh, Gosar, not Bubart, not all the rest. We can just go with Cawthorn. They decided to censure them. Why did they censure them, Mary? Because they decided, you know what? A violent insurrection that tries to kill us and overturn democracy is a step too far, even though we voted for Trump 93 percent of the time. That's right. And so when you when you sit there and, you, you know, and you try to hedge in, in the opening, you're like, ah, you know, they're I think you call them authoritarians uh, or you said they're against democracy. I've been using this word for a while now. I'm perfectly fine using this word. We're dealing with fascism. We're dealing oh, yeah. with the rise of fascism, Absolutely. white Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. authoritarianism. And, and what we have to do is connect the dots for the rest of the people who are overwhelmed during a pandemic, during inflation, during the, the fire hose of shit. We have to connect the dots and warn them what's happening literally as we're speaking because this coup is ongoing. Yeah. And the entire conservative movement no longer cares about democracy. It's power by any means necessary. Yeah. And yes, I've been using the term fascism since long before the 2020 election, as I think all of us here have. Uh, Elson, I want to turn to you, but first I want to say hi, Bob. Hi, hi Bob. hello. I don't I know if sorry. I said it as well as Rachel Maddow. I don't think you're going to switch <laughs> out her tape from me, but yeah. hi, Bob. Sorry. sorry, I'm running late. I was helping oh, no Madison worries. Cawthorn with his wardrobe. So I just... Ah, see, look at that. I did a <laughs> guys... gun joke. He did a wardrobe joke. We're on the same yeah. page. All right. You didn't even know, Bob, but yeah, no Wash clue. Open that's with right. A, with a, a Cawthorn dick. But, but wow. I just want to say this Bob okay. is invited because, in addition to his brain, he's the one with muscles. <laughs> and I'm here for the schlubs <laughs> to show the middle aged men that you can exist on Mary Trump show without, with a, without a six pack. You can have well, a I'm one glad pack. I'm not the only one with toys, by the way. So thank you, Wajahat. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> appreciate well, actually, your, your support. Yeah. I was thinking about, you, you know, because I'm total geek as well. I, I've just been watching the Umbrella Academy and I'm wondering where I can get those action figures. Actually, no, I'm not. I don't do that. But Bob probably has them. Um, yeah. Anyway, to continue with um, along these lines, uh, because again, I think the, a huge problem, AG, is um, that we always take so much for granted 
in America. And, uh, you know, Waji wrote a lot about that in your book. Um, but I think the extent to which our institutions are susceptible to bad actors was not really understood by most people until uh, 2017. And then, so I th the reason I think this is important uh, is because it doesn't, it's not work. Just talking about policy um, wins doesn't seem to be enough. I blame the media for that a lot, but, but it's also, it's not enough because that's not all that's going on. There is so much at stake. And I think the latest, not the latest example, but a recent example of that is uh, Ron Romney McDaniel, uh, head of the RNC, saying, well, you know what, we're not participating in debates anymore, which also seems to be part of a larger mission, right? Yeah, well, I mean, fascists don't debate. They're, they don't have ideas. That's not the point of their existence. Um, and I'm so glad, first of all, that you're doing this, this uh, Mary, these panels, because this is going to be up to us. Um, we've learned, if we, know, if we learn nothing from the Mueller investigation, don't put all your eggs in one man's basket, right? Don't, <laughs> I, I don't think anybody knows that as well as you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> people who say I alone can fix it or this person alone can fix it, uh, that's what autocrats uh, do and say. Now, it would be nice. We have to do this. We, we, as I've been saying since 2017, we are the Mullers we've been waiting for. Uh, we are the Garlands we've been waiting for. It would certainly be nice to have some help from, from our friends at the Fourth Estate because I, I'm maybe I'm missing it. I'm not seeing the Republicans in disarray chirons today when we have all these text messages and audio recordings of uh, McCarthy going after Gates and Brooks and then Gates and Stefanik going after Cheney and McCarthy and all, like all of this infighting, the circular firing squad, the, the rats are eating themselves, however you want to put it. But, you know, we have a little debate back and forth contemplating what to put in a one point nine trillion dollar infrastructure bill. And we're yeah. in disarray. Uh, but here they are trying to take each other down and out of, of political life. And, right. and, and just as a quick aside, because I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just think it's important to put that in context because I agree with you. Dems and disarray, 96% of Democrats in the Senate are on the same page. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's a really important uh, data point. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, that, you know, you you, you wrapped it up per perfectly because, and that goes along with the, on, along the lines of what Waj was saying and uh, what, what you were saying, Mary, about about the, the, the press and the media and how it, and it's, it's interesting too, that sort of reflexive control, that trick where when, Donald is in the White House and he's saying the media are the, the enemy of the people. And then, of course, the media continues to do what they do, which is to sell rage and get clicks and, and bring eyes. And we're like, hey, could we get a little bit of Republicans in disarray? Or yeah. maybe you want to talk about the fact that a sitting member of Congress, Marjorie Taylor Greene, texted the former White House chief of staff to suggest martial law to overthrow the government. Martial law. Oh, yeah, Marshall, like yeah, TM, PJ Maxwell, <laughs> Max whatever we're calling it today. Ross, dress watch her use that as an excuse. Oh, I, I, I actually didn't mean Marshall with a TIA a law. Yeah, or that the, fed, the fact that the former White House chief of staff is being investigated for voter fraud in three mm. states mm. and mm. also for, you know, an insurrection. That is all back burner. And I think it has to do with what you were talking about. Watch that fire party is a party of fascists. <laughs> They're trying to undermine American so-called democracy at every turn. But the Democrats seem also to be stuck. And I'm by Democrats, I mean Democrats in Congress seem to be stuck in this um, mold. They seem to keep thinking that they're the people on the other side of the aisle are their colleagues mm. as opposed mm -hmm. to their enemies. What do we do about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, listening to all of you talk, uh, it bears in mind the fact that we're missing Eric Bollert right now, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, oh man, he so would much. be having a field day with the lack of Republicans in disarray reporting uh, this yeah. week. And uh, it's it's funny, there's a dynamic with the press, I think. Uh, certainly it's happening on cable news, especially, where I think they look at the different parties 
in slots or in roles as you would cast them in a movie. Yeah. Uh, if you look at a, 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 a miniseries that just started called Gaslit on, I think it's Stars mm -hmm. with Julia Roberts and Sean yep. Penn. And this guy, Shea Wiggum, who's playing G. Gordon Liddy, who's an amazing portrayal of Liddy. But uh, this is something, the way the Republicans are behaving right now, this goes back 50 years, uh, mm -hmm. beyond 50 years. And I think to that extent, the corruption and the nefarious activities behind the scenes, the big lie and the insurrection, the things that we're seeing now and the things that we're all screaming about on social media, this has been going on on the Republican side for 50 years. When they were going into the 72 election, they were trouncing the Democrats. I think the yeah. polls were something like Nixon was leading in his reelection by, I don't know, 20 points or something over McGovern. And yet they still engaged G. Gordon Liddy. Magruder brought in G. Gordon Liddy with this whole Operation Gemstone where they were going to kidnap members of Democratic leadership and rendition them to Mexico for the duration of the rest of the election, cutting yeah. off all the heads of the Hydra, et cetera. I mean, this is something they were contemplating. And I think yeah. to an extent, the mainstream press still looks at the Republicans in that way and just regards that as being a given. Uh, well, the Re uh, they're just going to do that. Boys will be boys. Mm. And so fine. Yeah. And I think to an extent, also, the Democrats do that as well. I think the Democrats um, maybe suffer from something that should otherwise be a decent trait, which is they're still trying to be the grownups in the room. And I think that is admirable i think they believe that if they're not the grown-ups in the room and i'm not necessarily agreeing with this point of view but i think they believe if they're not the grown-ups in the room then without them there as a bulwark as a backstop for the system everything is going to fall apart if we all start acting like the republicans have then the system collapses and yep. there's a lot i think there's a valid argument there but at the same time there's a way they they can cling to factual reality and the truth and still be the grown-ups but still take the fight to the republicans rather than constantly responding to the republican message put forth a message a tough message uh that kind of outflanks the Republicans. And that's definitely missing right now. I yeah. mean, uh, uh, Senator mm -hmm. McMorrow uh, last mm -hmm. week in Michigan mm -hmm. delivered a great speech. And that's the kind of yeah. rhetoric, that's the kind of uh, speech writing, that's the kind of delivery that more Democrats need to be doing. Bear in mind, too, though, that she was responding to the that's Republican right. message mm -hmm. rather than relating yeah. the Democratic message, which should be separate. Like, there should be some other thing that's not a response to critical race theory. That's not a response to don't say gay, et cetera. While we should still fight on those topics. Yeah, it needs to be something new. And one of the things I've been proposing is attacking the Republicans' patriotism or lack of patriotism, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's, a, yeah. that's an area that has the benefit of being true. And there are many things to back that up. Start with the insurrection. Start with support for Vladimir Putin. 31 mm -hmm. senators uh, voting against aid to ukraine that's right and the list goes on and on from there so yeah seven uh, seven yeah. republican senators spending july mm -hmm. 4th in moscow um and then yeah. one house member okay bob there's a lot there um yeah. so <laughs> i want to back up a little bit um okay. because i i don't want to lose all of those threads although as Walsh knows i have ramadan brain and, yeah. and I have minor pause brain. Apparently <laughs> contained. Well, I don't have that anymore. But anyway, let's not go there. Um, it's not permanent then? No, it is not. Um, it's good to know. Good news. We bring you good news. Thank mm -hmm. you. Very rare. You case. found Jesus. <laughs> so like grownups in the room. Is that, I, I think that's, that, I started. That's what I wanted to. Room, yeah. Um, yeah. I, and, but I also want to go into the history a little bit, but let's stick mm. with uh, grownups in the room. I, I was speaking with uh, my fir very first panel, which was uh, David Rothkopf, Kavita Patel, Norm Ornstein. And David made this the perfectly valid point. You know, Michelle Obama <laughs> really blew it when she said, we go high. And I don't necessarily think she meant, meant it in the way every so many other people interpreted it. But, you know, we can be grownups and still be really fucking good MMA fighters, right? Yeah. You know, I, I think that um, that's the problem. It doesn't mean be a doormat. It doesn't mean be, how can we be grownups and be polite in the face of, you know, 
the other side literally wanting our <laughs> extinction, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. literally wanting to take away the rights of so many of us. Literally, people say, oh, they want to turn this country into 1950. No, they don't. They want to turn it into 1850, right, Raj? Yeah, I mean, so to connect the dots, uh, uh, and a lot was said there, is you can be a grown up and still kick ass. Yes. You can respond and hold on to your ethics and values and still confront the reality that's in your face, which is a fascist reality. And what Democrats believe and all the institutions believe is that if you just bend a knee to Republicans and how they work the refs, which is how they work the media, and I'm going to talk about the media in a second, they work yep. the refs, and this is what they do. Perpetual victimhood, endless grievance. That's right. Institutions are against us. The media is against us. And so it's the Charlie Brown, classic peanut Charlie Brown Lucy episode, right, where every single institution, especially media institutions, say, OK, this time, will you behave properly? And Lucy's like, uh-huh. Yeah. And then Charlie comes to kick the football and she takes away the football and they're like, oops. And then, you know, it's like I always joke that Democrats bring a blunt pencil to a knife fight. Yeah. And Mitch McConnell brings the bazooka. Who's going to win nine out of 10 times? Right. And so in this particular situation, you have to confront the reality, like you mentioned, that these people want to kill you. They yeah. wanted to kill Mike Pence. And if you're in the media, and I, and I think I'm glad we're talking about the media real quick, because when it comes to media institutions, I worked for CNN. I, you know, I write for The New York Times. I write for Daily Beast. There are many people out there trying to do good work. Mm -hmm. What people need to understand is the incentive for media institutions, especially cable news, is the North Star is ratings and profit. Anyone yep. who tells you otherwise is either ignorant or lying to you. The or White living House in the 1960s. Yeah, or the, 60s. the White House Correspondents Dinner is this weekend. Let me yeah. tell you a quick story. Three years ago, I was there. I got invited to one of these many parties. Guess who was having the greatest time of their life at this party filled with commentators, reporters, and journalists? What? Sean Spicer, the man who was the first press secretary who lied to their faces. Yeah. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who aggressively lied to their faces, was, give, was given a, a going away party by reporters. Right. And so these individuals realize they need to court access. They need money. I'll give you an example. The CBS News president, according to audio <laughs> tapes, said we need to hire um, Mick Mulvaney as, as a as a as a correspondent. Yeah because we need access because the GOP are going to get power again. So you're looking at a very incestuous ecosystem where individuals for access ratings and powers realize they have to cozy up to the conservative establishment and the Republicans who perpetually play the victim card and say, everyone's against us. All institutions bend the knee. And by bending the knee, you're inviting the Fox into the hen house. And as I've just look at the past four years, has any sort of conciliatory, you know, uh, olive branch reformed or moderated the Republican Party or conservative voices. If you can show it to me, I'd love to see it. Instead, what they do is they infiltrate, they take over and they promote their disinformation and propaganda. And so what Democrats have to do, and this is my article that I'm doing this week for the Daily Beast is I'm glad you mentioned Mallory. Democrats have to message. You cannot rely upon your your successes because nobody cares. As Biden said last week, well, if you don't share your successes, no one knows. The Democrats in their genius, if I'll just end on this. this let's just remind, remind, remind people this. Nancy Pelosi had to be forced to impeach Donald Trump the first time. The Vice did a piece last week that says Democrats don't want to respond to the grooming accusations. I'm in Virginia where Terry McAuliffe did not respond to the CRT accusations. What happened? And when Mallory and, and, and Elizabeth Warren, I'll, I'll end on this. It took only one senator. I'm like, there is a gift from God, manna from heaven, 2000 texts, literally implicating the entire conservative movement in a violent insurrection that is not supported by the majority. Only one senator came out on the news channels over the weekend to call them traitors. One, Elizabeth yeah. Warren. That's mm -hmm. a problem, Mary. Mm. It's Thank the you for problem. coming to my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's, uh, can, do you mind if I say something really quick about the correspondence dinner? No, go. Because when you talked about that and everyone palling around, even though they're a-holes, it reminded me of watching some C-SPAN stuff going on in Congress and Senate in the past. And they're debating and fighting. And, the, you know, the right is saying these racist, awful things. And then afterwards, they're all shaking hands and hanging out in the cloakroom. And it wasn't until a Republican, Liz Cheney, the first time I heard of anyone where Jim Jordan reaches out to shake her hand and she's, don't touch me, you effing did this. And I was like, that's more real to me than, yeah. than what I see going on. I just wanted to point yeah. that out because I, I yeah. saw it in Congress a lot too. Yeah. And, and, you know, I just want to uh, 
say two things really quickly. First of all, you know, I think instead of the like, grown up in the room, Democrats need to start acting like parents <laughs> whose children like imagine you're a parent and your child comes over to you very upset because the parent of one of his or her friends smacked her, smacked your kid. Hmm. Do you let the that other adult come over and explain it and say, oh, yeah, pff, let's, we're, it's cool. Don't worry about it. Or hmm. Your kid is like has bruises and is hysterical and traumatized. No, hmm. you don't. <laughs> you don't wait for an explanation. You see the evidence in front of your eyes. Right. So I think I think we need to be acting like grownups whose children are being abused by these other people. <laughs> um, and the only uh, slight pushback was is I, like, I don't think this is a conservative move and I don't think there's anything conservative about these people mm. anymore. And and kind of by using that term, I, it it almost um, it normalizes them because that's the kind of language people are familiar with. Oh, you know, they're conservatives. Right. So, no, my bad. I wanted to implicate the entire conservative movement as being part and parcel of this fascist movement in the sense that it's not just the GOP, but I'm also talking about grassroots movements, the donors, the media, any any part and parcel of the right wing institution yeah. is now committed that towards I what with. I think is a fascist movement, which yes. is power by any means necessary. Yes. Yeah. And um, AG, you know, getting back to what Bob was saying earlier about the fact that this is this is a long time coming, I would suggest that it goes even even further back um, because Nixon stole the 68 election. Yeah, he tried to, even though he didn't need to, but what he did in 68 was infinitely worse. And, you know, it sort of reminds me of uh, what Donald did with Ukraine, except again, infinitely worse because, because of, uh, because of, Nixon's behind the scenes machinations uh, with South Koreans. You could argue that um, so so he could make Johnson look bad and he could win the election. He made sure that the war continued and more Americans died needlessly. And yet we don't talk about that either. It's lit and like Ronald Reagan was a friggin Nazi. And yet he's portrayed as like the last sort of normal mainstream Republican president. So we're talking about decades worth of gaslighting. Yeah. And even in The Reckoning, your book, you go all the way back to the beginning. I forgot you actually read it. Cool. <laughs> you, you know, talking about the Supreme Court being one of the biggest tools of white supremacy in, in our country. and. Right. Uh, the failure of reconstruction, leaving loopholes open so that we could backslide into white supremacy again, you know, just in case we'll just leave the back door open a little bit. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And of course, the parties have flip flopped a couple of times because, you know, you'll never miss a Republican having their chance to say, you know, Lincoln was a Republican. You're like, all right. Yeah. OK. And, and <laughs> what's the joke? Nick Cage won an Oscar once, too. It's lots <laughs> so, yeah, it, and it's. And it's generational and it's now in our DNA and that trauma is in the DNA of marginalized people. And mm -hmm. we just keep hanging on to and perpetuating this white supremacy. And it's and it it changes forms every 30 or 40 years or so. Uh, but it's always been rooted in the same exact group of people doing the same exact stuff, trying to do anything to hold on to power, uh, because any time, as you wrote, any time uh, a black person starts to fight back. Then they just say, oh, look at the violent black people That's right. and put them right back into the cycle uh, of, uh, of of white supremacy. So I, this is just a, the, the new iteration, uh, but it does reek of 68 and 72 and it does reek of 1930s Germany as well. So it's, you know, it, it's deeply uh, ingrained in our country and the fabric of this society. Absolutely. And 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 Bob, you could say that th this is the trajectory of America since its inception. Um yeah. You know, I I wrote in the book that I think only Allison read uh, that the the prospect of being a person of color in this country is almost impossible. I mean, it is impossible for a white person to imagine, yeah. uh, you know, um, and what seems to be happening, though. Yes, it's a like there's this overarching uh, theme of lack of accountability and white supremacy. And yet what seems to be happening now is that 
things kind of went underground, even though, again, in 68, 72, the racism was hideous. Uh, it continued to be hideous. The quote unquote war on drugs, um, housing, just it never ended. It just became less polite to speak yeah. about it out loud. Now, however, it seems like it's it's almost required if you're a Republican to be openly anti-democratic, mm -hmm. openly racist, openly every everything. I mean, look what they're doing with trying to turn back the clock in terms of LGBTQ, in yep. terms of birth control, for God's sakes, interracial marriage. Right. Do you, doesn't it seem like that's that's another trend, too, that's like dragging us back, that the openness, the brazenness of it. It's it's almost like it it makes some people it makes it really difficult for some people to take it in because it's mm -hmm. so gobsmacking. And yeah. then on, on the other side, it gives people who support it permission, mm -hmm. which empowers them. Yeah. And, and let's be clear about something, too, about the modern Trump controlled Republican Party, that there are no longer any core values there. It's all about branding and it's all yeah. about winning elections. So they're going to say whatever they need to say from uh, being as racist as they possibly can be, because being racist wins them that voting block, the racist voting block. This is a, a, an increasingly extremist Republican Party. And in order to win elections uh, by being that extremist, by pursuing these voters, that's why you get some of these voter suppression laws or all of the voter suppression laws, because they have to make up for the fact that their voter base is so narrow they're not going for moderates. They're not going for swing voters anymore because they can't get them. They can't get them and appease the racist vote at the same time. So that's a, a major, not impediment, but that's a major thing that the Republicans have had to overcome. And that's why you've got the, uh, as I said, voter suppression laws to make up for that. Um, but this goes back. In fact, Mary, we talked about it on, on my show. I did read your book, especially the part about the Civil War. I was just joking. <laughs> Reconstruction. I know three people read it. It's OK. <laughs> and, and, I also and, read it. I know. From cover to cover. One, two, three. Yeah. yeah it doesn't count that I read it for the audio book. Yeah. It doesn't count. <laughs> well, it counts. It counts. And the origins of this do go all the way back to the Civil War and Reconstruction. Uh, you can see echoes of it reverberating throughout history. And part of the problem is, I think, with this uh, pushback against teaching some of the racist history of the United States is obviously intentional to make up for the fact that they don't want anyone to know that the screams for civil rights and enfranchisement and elections and so on have a long shadow that go back you know, hundreds of years and more closely uh, since the Civil War, where you can really trace the issues that we're having right now uh, with race in this country and voter suppression in this country all the way back to that period of time and how this demographic of Americans has been routinely oppressed in the most heinous ways possible, from Jim Crow laws to, uh, you know, the, the most ridiculous laws you've ever heard. I mean, some of the Jim yeah. Crow laws are just absolutely absurd. For example, there was one, there were a series of laws against vagrancy where you could be picked up on the street if you didn't have proof of employment, sort, sort of the progenitor of the papers, please laws that's, right. that we had uh, in uh, Arizona and so on, where you could be picked up on the street. And if you can't prove that you've got a job, uh, and obviously you're a black person, hmm. you are arrested, thrown through some kangaroo court and renditioned off to what is referred to uh, by the author Douglas Blackman as hmm. uh, as neo slavery. There are just sure. and it happened through there were uh, neo slavery camps in the mm -hmm. South. Yeah. A few of them left into the 1980s, yep. but FDR at the start of World War II had the FBI shut down a bunch of them. These are the things that I think um, young Americans especially need to know from the basic idea of, of understanding American history, but also understanding why black people are still going, yeah, we're not getting a fair deal here. This is not equal protection as it should be. And for that matter, LGBTQ citizens are facing a similar kind of uphill climb because now the Republicans are closing that door. We're not going to teach young people about why these groups are so upset with the current status quo in the United States. 
And so it's it's almost a rear guard move. We're we're pushing ahead and we're going to close the door behind us and no one's going to learn about this. Yeah, well, you can't break the cycle of generational yeah. abuse yeah. unless you acknowledge that you have been right. abused and that you're abusing people. Exactly. It's the same in a, in a nuclear family as it is in a society. Yeah. Right? But yeah. Mary, can, yeah. can I say uh, just based on what just jumping off what Bomb said, wh why the, the myth is so important. The myth is so important to maintain because as Rick Santorum said, before he got finally fired from CNN is we birthed this nation from right. nothing. Yeah. Sure. There were some native Americans here, but we white Christian men came here and birthed this nation. This is part and parcel yeah. of the white Christian nationalist narrative that God has favored America for the white Christian man to come and birth into civilization and progress and modernity, and also to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth so Jesus can come and there'll be mm -hmm. a rapture, right? You think I'm joking, yep. but I'm not. No, but also not. Nope. the way nope. what you, you take it down from the, the, the spiritual to the secular, if you take away the myth, then this is what you're confronted with. Oh, my God, there's something called white supremacy. Oh, my God, black people were enslaved. Oh, my God, women didn't have the right to vote. Oh, my God, this whole bootstrapping uh, uh, myth is exactly that. Oh, people can't pull themselves from the bootstrap because the boot was on their neck. That's right. Hmm. The system is unequal. Hmm. I have privileges. And if I confront and acknowledge the real history of this country and, and I undo this myth, then I'm not a superior man by birth or by, by hard work or by merit. It's by unfair advantages. And then the question becomes, what is my role in perpetuating this system? And then right. the question becomes, oh, wait, I have to do something to give away my privilege for equity. I can't do that. So instead, I'm going to promote the myth that this country is a yeah. special country. If you just work hard and you pull yourself up from your bootstraps, everything's equal. And you blacks who are whining and complaining, look at the good Asians and the good model minorities. Look at them. They're the good immigrants. Why can't you be like yeah. them? And right. see, there's no racism. Look, Wodge is on New York Times. That Asian American is up there and spelling really well. So you blacks and refugees and lazy Latinos just work harder. This is right. why the myth is so foundational mm -hmm. to this extremist right wing movement right. and to white Christian nationalism. And if you teach the real history, it shatters them completely. It shatters everything. Right. And which is I mean, first of all, let's let's just be really clear. There's nothing more lazy than a rich white man who enslaves other people to do his fucking work for him. Um, lazy is just one word. But just yeah. considering that that's the epithet. Mm -hmm. But they racist were white people. well, Mary. They were yeah, treated of, well. Of course they were. Of course they were. States' rights. Uh, um, <laughs> but you know, all of the the complex. In some ways, it's very simple, and in some ways, it's very complex. You know, was you 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 uh, talked briefly about you know manifest destiny. People do not understand the damage that the Calvinist foundation of the northeastern uh, colonies did to the future of this country. Um, this is a conversation for another time that I think is definitely worth having. But, you know, the bottom line is that because the history is complex and because uh, white people in power do not want to give up mm. their power and their completely unearned privilege, um, they also... You know, white working people are also disadvantaged, just as they have been since the very beginning, when rich white people convince them that the worst thing they could do is create an alliance with black laborers and formerly enslaved people, which, of course, would have been much better for all working people. But they were white working people back then were convinced that white privilege the, the privilege of being white and all the power that that's conferred was infinitely preferable to being um, economically better off if that puts you on a par with people of color, right? Yeah. So they're still doing this shit, right, AG? Like, that's why we're, we can't talk about working class people in this country. We have to talk about white working class people and black working class people. We have to talk about white evangelicals and black evangelicals because those are very, 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 very different things. Um, I do want to just shift gears a little bit, um, even though this is all related, uh, and focus more on the Democratic Party, Democratic voters, um, because 
what I think Democrats don't like to face is that white Democrats have maybe not as much, but still significant amount of trouble admitting their own unearned privilege. Uh, and that's a huge problem because if if we can't do that, then we cannot fully own the history that all three of you have been talking about tonight, right? And I think, Waj, when you were on last time, we had this conversation about um, how Democrats treat the Democratic base versus how Republicans treat the Republican base. First of all, the media treat them as sort of the same, equal and opposite. First problem, the Republican base is a bunch of white supremacists, fascist, misogynist, anti-immigrant, anti-everything, right? The Democratic base is mostly women of color. Uh, uh, well, yeah, mostly. <laughs> mostly that. Um, but it's, you know, it's a much more, obviously this goes outside, but it's a much more diverse uh, coalition uh, that it's a much bigger tent, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, you know, AG, I wish that, uh, and, and by the way, the Democratic base is also full of people who want everybody to do better. They mm. want everybody to have health care. They want everybody to have a living wage and and good education that isn't going to impoverish them for the rest of their lives. And yet the Republicans cede so much power to their base. And the Democrats always say, particularly to its uh, voters of color, you know, just Wait until the next cycle and you'll get something from us. Yeah. What the fuck? I, it's, I mean, I'm sick. I can't even imagine. Like, how do you keep asking people to save your ass and give them nothing in return? And it's not so it's not surprising. And the, the reason I'm bringing this up now is because, you know, we're, we're talking about an enthusiasm ga gap right now. And I'm like, how is that possible? We're, we're going to lose everything. And yet, in, to, in some respects, I think the Democrats have themselves to blame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, we wouldn't have the majority in the Senate if it weren't for black voters. We, we wouldn't have uh, a Democrat in the White House if it weren't for black, especially black women voters. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't have a, a new a black woman, first black woman Supreme Court justice if it weren't for black voters. And yet the people uh, who put people like Joe Manchin in the majority party are not getting anything back out. Mm. They right. aren't like, how is it not like, we need to get rid of the filibuster and give back to the folks who put us in power here. Um, and we need to do it now because only then, I mean, when when does the payback happen? How, how, how many times do you think you can do this? How many times do you think you can say, just like you said, Mary, just this one last time and we'll get there. And uh, oh no, we need two more senators. You inshallah, guys inshallah, just say That's inshallah. Right. Inshallah, inshallah right. <laughs> We just need two more senators. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry. No, next time we need we need ten more now, guys. Uh, no, that we'll is true. Get there. But and then they turn around and almost say, you know, it's your fault for not electing sixty senators <laughs> in, right. and uh, enough people. And until the accountability happens, until the accountability happens, where we stop giving a pass. To, to the the ingrained white supremacy and the fascism, it's going to continue to be that way, and I I and that's why I think projects like this are so important. It's like what what can we do? This kind of stuff is what we have to do um, in order to get in order to get the word out. You know, I, yeah. I don't know I don't know how else to I can't scream it any louder. You know, I, I don't I, uh, Bob, you you go before me. I have something to say on that if if I have time, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, go, no, go ahead. Go right ahead. No, but so so it's it's like this for for voters of color, right? It's it's about loving a country that doesn't love you back. It's right. about voting for a democratic party that wants you as a side piece, but not as the main date. I'll just be you honest. You talked about that with uh, Bush and, and Obama, uh, the differences between the Muslim voting bloc for Bush and Obama. I'll, and you I, know, I thought, Muslims, okay. I'll give you an example. The last 20 years, Muslims went for Bush in 2000. I did not, ladies and gentlemen, because the Republican Party, unlike Democrats, said, we're going to court them. Were you old enough to vote? Yes, that was my first uh, election. And I begged people. I said, for the love of God, please don't do it. But the reason why... 
enough people want is like, look, Democratic Party ignores us. Yeah. When I I was at a 2008, Barack Obama was running, right? Howard Dean, there was when I was in the Bay Area, came to for a fundraiser. The fundraiser were hosted by many South Asian Muslim first generation Americans. I raised my hand. And I said, how come the Democratic Party hasn't spoken out against the Islamophobia? How come it took Colin Powell to say it? And <laughs> Howard Dean just looked at me and said, the elections in three weeks. Translation. Keep your mouth shut. We'll punt it. Inshallah, just win. Keep quiet. Now, if you talk to black voters, Latino voters, Muslim voters, Asian American voters, it's been like this forever. We've been in a chokehold of white supremacy. We are expected like the Justice League. And I'm seeing the Justice League because I see the toys in Bob's background. So I didn't say the Avengers. <laughs> to save the Democratic Party from itself, to save the Republic in France, to save the American democracy, right? And then during a pandemic, when black voters in particular were out during a pandemic without a vaccine, risking their lives, they said, hey, can you do something about voting rights? Can you do something about, I don't know, police reform? Can you do Stop something killing about immigration us. reform? Yeah. Stop killing us. And mm -hmm. the Democrats respond by the following. And this is why everything we've talked about so far is connected. The Democratic Party centers whiteness, just like America, and says, we're going right. to chase Karen and Amy, not Stacey. And we're going to go after the white voter that has abandoned us from 1950s. And we're going to be afraid of our own shadow, which is black. And we don't want to be seen as too woke. And we're going to use the weaponized bad faith language of wokeness against our fellow Democrats instead of lifting them right. up. Oh, my God. And we're going to yes. blame them instead of Terry McAuliffe running a lazy campaign in Virginia. And, and, and black voters and Latino voters and young voters and Muslim voters, you're watching. This is my fear. You're seeing the polls they're like F this. I'm yep. done. Yep. F yeah. Both sides right. are the same. They both belong to white folk. White folks, you figure this out. And meanwhile, the rest of us are saying we can't set this out because fascism around the corner. But you can't blame them. Right. No, you can't. And Bob, it's almost as if people are saying, or maybe it is as if people are saying, you know, even though the Republican Party is evil <laughs> and they're going to take everybody's rights away, at least they're fighting, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and yeah. the Democrats are just like, oh, shit. You know, let's 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 not let's not do that. And and you know, we're seeing all of these dots connect because of you know, Watch just ended by referencing Terry McCullough's pathetic gubernatorial campaign mm -hmm. in Virginia. I mean, imagine Bob if yeah. he had said Glenn Youngkin is a fucking racist, and this is what CRT is, and this is how it's not taught in school or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are many Democrats who are fighting the good fight when it comes mm, to sure. race. And uh, certainly like, we we tend to forget sometimes that in 2008, Barack Obama won Indiana. That's a that's a pretty significant mile marker in the history yeah. of race in this country. And we forget about that for some reason, where you end up getting guys like James Carville, who had his time, but he's living in an old school democratic, uh, 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 I don't know what you would call it. He's, he's looking at things through an old school lens, right? He's shoving everything through that prism. So he gets on television on a routine basis and we, oh, we got to stop with this rope, this woke crap. We got to stop, stop talking like that. This wokeness is causing problems for Democrats. What he's doing is he's looking at the landscape and thinking, Oh, well, we still have to grovel before swing voters mm. and try to figure out yep. how to get, you know, working class whites to come back to the Democratic Party. That ship has sailed. Yep. We now we exist in the era of negative partisanship, to quote uh, Rachel Bittacopper, where it's not about you're, you're not going to get certain factions of voters. The, the ship has sailed. It's a new paradigm for American politics. And I think the sooner Democrats figure out and remember, by and large, across the board, that the base of the Democratic Party isn't the progressive left. The base of the Democratic Party are black women, center left black women. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the sooner we get that through our heads, the more progress we can start to make, where we can start to get a little more aggressive, where we're yep. too timid in some ways because we're concerned, like James Carville is, concerned about scaring off working class white guys. Yeah. <laughs> like like yeah. white like that's white what it men is. are ever that's, coming that's back exactly to the Democratic it. Party in the it near is. future. You know and, what I mean? I mean, what I would say is, you know, working class white guys who voted for Donald twice can fuck right off, and I don't care about them. <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry. Yeah. Because... You know, the other thing Democrats don't seem to understand is I just don't like Hillary for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's her boobs. 
Maybe it's the ovaries. I don't know. Maybe I, it's the double I, X chromosomes. I, I think it was the emails. But anyway, um, you know, we're, we got to wrap up, but I, I want to end here. Um, we need to convince, I, we shouldn't have to, but apparently we need to convince white Democrats that if, you know, <laughs> if we don't help other people in our party get the same rights the rest of us have, voting rights, for example, or uh, increasingly, it looks like, you know, the right to choose and have bodily autonomy. The right uh, to the jog right through a neighborhood without getting to jog through a neighborhood. Uh, the right to um, raise a family in a way that you that that uh, is um, supported. Mm. Uh, the right to marry whomever you want. Then it, we all lose. Right. We all on the left will lose. So I think, um, you know, what I would say if somebody said, you know, the Democrats woke, blah, blah, blah. And I think it was Chris Coons who who used that in their you know, it complained about one of his Democratic Senate colleagues that he was too woke or whatever bullshit. They don't even know what it means. Woke just means it's the same thing with political correctness or safe spaces. It just means you give a shit about other human beings and you want to support them, right? So I'd, I'd rather be woke than a fucking fascist. Right. Mm. That, I mean, that's my bumper sticker. So let's all end with a bumper sticker. That's mine tonight. I'd rather be woke than a fascist. Watch. What's your bumper sticker? I like that. I'll, I'll double that. I'd rather be woke than a fascist, and I'd rather live in a flawed democracy than a fascist state. <laughs> a a, a well-run one. <laughs> yeah. Is nice. she? Oh, I didn't know I was going to be asked for my bumper sticker. I didn't know I, either, I, actually. It just report. occurred to me. You can't fit the Mueller report on a bumper sticker. That's right. Exactly. That's. <laughs> I think that's the that's point of the exercise, sticker. right? That's my yeah. bumper sticker. You can't fit the 1-6 committee report on a bumper sticker. Love it. Bob? <laughs> Oh, uh, gee, you know what? I'm going to go with a quote for mine. I, I, I didn't realize we were, we'd had to bring bumper stickers, but I didn't either. I'm telling you, this is spontaneous. <laughs> this is happening live in real time. But it's seriously like this is what the Democrats need to do. They need to think mm -hmm. on their feet and they need to get clever. I hate to say it, but yes, they do. And witty. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, you can do a pretty strong pro-Democratic bumper sticker by just saying Democrats, America's party. Uh, the Democratic Party needs to position itself as the American Party. We're, it's a big tent party. There are lots of sub factions in there that are all under this big tent. And there's the benefit of contrasting that with the Republican Party, which seems to be the party of Putin and the party of insurrection, invading right. and occupying the Capitol building and things like that. There's so much to be said in Democrats, America's Party. I think that is yes. a positioner that I think would work well for the party. Yeah, and honestly, I think we, we should keep going with this. I actually have a Shopify store. It's not open yet, but, you know, it's T-shirts, whatever. And um, don't vote for fascists. That's another one. So let's keep generating <laughs> yeah. these ideas. Yeah. Let's let's sell some T-shirts, send some bumper stickers, raise some money for Democratic organizations, get out the vote, whatever, uh, or my pack, Dem Democracy Defense Fund, whatever, whatever's doing good. And um, let's help get these kinds of messages out because – we one we definitely need it because I I'm I'm really wondering what the hell's going on with our uh, elected Democrats in in terms of this stuff. I'm not talking about They've policy. Conceded. They've I'm conceded. I'm talking about they've well conceded the loss of 2022. We're already. not going to let them because we lose in 2022. We lose everything. That's another That's good bumper sticker, right? Yeah. So we also need messengers like mm -hmm. you guys. You are so smart. You are so eloquent. You are so committed to this cause and you are all, and I, you know, this is uncomfortable for me to say because I've been so conditioned, but I'm trying to uncondition myself. You are all patriots. And I, I don't rem I think it was Waj said earlier. We need to start embracing that. We need to take that word back. We claim it. We yes. Need to it. yes. What it means. We love this country and we want this country to work for everybody so thank all of you you're going to have to come back because we are not done by a long shot thank you for everything you do oh thank, thank you so you. much Mary. and you know what uh i promised my podcast partner buzz burbank that i would mention his name so there now he's going to give me five bucks for <laughs> hey, <that>. buzz. So. <laughs> hi buzz <laughs> Uh, I, right. I thank you, Mary, for doing what you do, and thank you for hosting the space. And, yes, and, and you, we Mary. have to kickstart. We have to do the work. I think Allison was saying it right. Like a lot of people are outsourcing everything to the superheroes, to the Avengers, right. the Justice League. They ain't coming. They ain't coming. That's right. It's going to be up to us. 
Yeah. Yep. Thanks again, Mary. And everybody stay on Twitter. Stay there. Yes, right. Absolutely. Yes. We're not going Don't anywhere. Don't see any space. Don't nope. see any ground. Exactly. I agree with you. All right. Thank you all. Stay safe and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all so much for listening to tonight's episode of the Mary Trump Show Strategy Sessions. And thank you to my brilliant guests, my friends, Allison Gill, Wajahad Ali, and Bob Seska. It's always such a pleasure to talk to them. I always learn something when I do. I, please make sure to catch every, every strategy session Tuesday nights on youtube.com slash Politicon live, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. I always say specific. Ay, ay, ay. I am such a New Yorker. Pacific. Uh, and our regular Thursday episodes as well, youtube.com slash Politicon, also 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. You can also uh, follow Politicon on YouTube and like the episodes. But uh, if you click the bell um, here, you will also be sure to be notified every time a new episode drops. So do that as well. You can get every episode on Apple or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And it would be really, really great if you gave the show a five-star rating because it really does help other people find it. And, you know, we really, we really want to be spreading the word. Okay. Uh, this is stuff is so important and I'm so grateful to have people willing to have these conversations with me. And also I'm so grateful to all of you for wanting to listen to them. Uh, and we'll just keep them coming. So thanks again for being here. We'll see you next week. Stay safe and be kind. Mm -hmm.